tonight on America in Black. That's when I find out what you really made of. T.D. Jakes is one of the most powerful and influential religious leaders in America today. This is your season. And now the best-selling author and pastor is building his brand as CEO. I want to keep doing something, building something, helping somebody. T.D. Jakes opens up to Ed Gordon about the power of the pulpit and his controversial billion-dollar move aimed at uplifting the black community. Being an entrepreneur and a preacher, do you see the duality there? But first, an America in Black exclusive, addressing an unfolding crisis. The United States, being one of the richest countries in the world, has one of the highest rates of maternal mortality. The numbers are striking. Too many Black women dying from childbirth. It literally has to do with the color of her skin. CBS News correspondent Danya Bacchus talked to Vice President Kamala Harris and grieving families about the racial disparities in health care that too often lead to a mother's death. Do you think race was a factor in Shanice's death? It was definitely a factor. And from humble beginnings, painter Kahindi Wiley is now one of the most in-demand artists in the world. That's pretty sharp. <laughs> CBS Saturday Morning co-host Michelle Miller has the story of the star visual artist who found success elevating the image of ordinary black people. When you go to a Kande Wiley exhibition, people recognize who is in the room and they recognize it looks like them. Plus, beats from the motherland, the music genre taking the world by storm. MTV correspondent Dometi Pongo explores the rise of Afrobeats and the music's growing cross-cultural appeal. Why do you think African music is resonating? There's no vibe like our vibe. And later... Did we learn our parents' music? Yes, we did. Roy Wood Jr. drops the mic on how black music unites us across generations. All this and more tonight on America in Black. Welcome back to another edition of America in Black. I'm CBS News correspondent Danya Backus. We want to begin our show by exploring a health crisis impacting far too many black women and families. In the United States, black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women, numbers among the highest in the developed world. Tonight, you will hear painful stories of lives lost, and you will hear from those trying to address the crisis, including the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Can you point to the flower, Charlotte? Where's the flower? Point to the flower. Good job, high five. I love being a father. Charlotte is a joy. I didn't plan on being a single parent, though. I wanted to be a parent with my wife, Shanice. Anthony Wallace and his wife, Shanice, were ecstatic when they found out she was pregnant with their first child. <laughs> the girl! It didn't matter to me whether it was a girl or a boy. I was just so happy that we were having a child together. Anthony says he and Shanice, a chief resident in pediatrics at the Indiana University School of Medicine, had started making plans for their baby girl. We were expecting that we had a smooth pregnancy, we're going to have a smooth delivery, we're going to raise our child together. But that plan began to unravel when around her 36th week, during a routine prenatal checkup, doctors discovered Shanice had preeclampsia, persistent high blood pressure that develops during pregnancy or the postpartum period. She had to have an emergency C-section. They performed a cesarean and Charlotte is born. But things began to go downhill for Shanice. Anthony was told Shanice was experiencing internal bleeding. She is somewhat verbal. What were those conversations? Letting her know I'm here, and she's telling me she's OK. She gets taken to the ICU. So it's the last time I heard her voice. Whew. Um... Two days after giving birth, Shanice died. She was 30 years old. Anthony's unimaginable grief is mixed with anger. He believes his wife's death could have been prevented. She was voicing that she was having pain in her body. And the doctor looked at her and said, you're just having a panic attack. They weren't listening to her. Do you think race was a factor in Shanice's death? It was definitely a factor. 
Tragically, Shanice's story is rapidly becoming more common in the United States, especially among black women. According to the CDC, the maternal mortality rate in 2021 was 89% higher than the rate in 2018. Nationwide, black women are three times more likely to die during pregnancy than white women. These numbers and lives lost have drawn the attention of the White House. In our exclusive interview, Vice President Kamala Harris said addressing the issue of maternal mortality is one of her priorities. The United States, being one of the richest countries in the world, has one of the highest rates of maternal mortality. It's a health care crisis in America happening right before our eyes. And I felt the need to take it on in a substantial way. These stories should compel all of us to take on this crisis. Since becoming vice president, Kamala Harris hosted the first ever Maternal Day of Action at the White House and recently toured the Baby to Baby Distribution Headquarters in Los Angeles, dedicated to providing supplies and resources to mothers in need. When you look at the statistics, they are staggering. Yeah. Why are black women in particular dying at that rate? Well, one reality of it that may be hard for some people to hear is because um, she's black. When she walks into that clinic, that doctor's office, that hospital, she is not taken as seriously. Another reality of this issue is that it has nothing to do with her socioeconomic level or her educational level. It literally has to do with the color of her skin and the biases that are present in the system. One of the things you've really pushed for is implicit bias training yes. for medical workers. Yes. Why is that so important? Data tells us that recent medical association surveys that when they have questioned medical students that a significant number of them still carry biases around whether black people have a different pain threshold. I mean, it's shocking to think that that is possible. As hard as we try, we have not fully undone the 400 years of systemic racism that have been taking place in the United States. Dr. Amanda Williams is one of the preeminent leaders in maternal mortality and health equity and an adjunct professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Unfortunately, the United States is the most dangerous developed country in the world to have a baby. There's no one that's even close. And for black women and birthing people, those statistics are even worse. This is not a problem that goes away with access to top doctors, top hospitals, and good insurance policies. Serena Williams! Even Serena Williams had to advocate for herself when she experienced life-threatening complications after the birth of her daughter, Olympia. Half of the deaths are in the postpartum period. So we are not out of the woods once the baby is out. To address this issue and others, Vice President Harris proposed legislation that, among other things, extends postpartum Medicaid from 60 days to one full year, creates a designation for certain proven hospitals as birthing friendly, and also allocates billions of dollars to diversify the maternal health care workforce. One element the vice president and many healthcare workers believe can help save women's lives during and after childbirth is the increased use of doulas who provide physical, emotional, and informational support. Here she is. Felicia Francis Edwards is a doula who has spent her career dedicated to maternal and child health. She works with Frontline Doulas, a community program that provides free access to care for black mothers in Los Angeles. I had so many women say that they're off top, first meeting, I'm afraid I'm going to die. You've seen firsthand mm -hmm. the bias that women experience. Absolutely. I've seen the doctors say really inappropriate things. I've watched people dismiss um, black women. Our work is important because a lot of times we go to spaces where we're the only other brown, black face there. I got to support you. I'm going to educate you. I'm going to teach you advocacy so that you can put yourself in a position to make an informed choice. The ultimate goal is that we end these disparities and that there are no barriers to a woman being able to have a joyful pregnancy and delivery of a healthy child. 
That's the, the ultimate goal. Bubbles! Whoa! We're excited! It's the joy of childbirth. Anthony Wallace wants every woman to experience and why so many are working to ensure children like two-year-old Charlotte don't have to grow up without their mothers. Mommy, Daddy, it's Charlotte. Yeah. In 2022, Anthony filed a complaint against the hospital where Shanice gave birth and died. And he says he plans to file a formal lawsuit. We reached out to the hospital for comment. They did not respond to our questions. What is your hope by sharing your story? I want to help bring it in to black mothers losing their lives in childbirth. I want to bring more awareness to the black maternity crisis. It's gone on far too long. Who's the sweetest girl in the whole wide world? Coming up next, he is perhaps the most popular religious leader in America. Ed Gordon sits down with T.D. Jakes to discuss his disruptive thinking and his new controversial billion-dollar business venture. When America in Black continues in a moment. Welcome back to America in Black. I'm special correspondent Ed Gordon. Few religious leaders in America are as influential or well-known as Bishop T.D. Jakes. Jakes is the founder of the Dallas-based megachurch, The Potter's House, the author of more than 30 books, and the CEO of a burgeoning media company. I recently traveled to Dallas to talk with America's preacher about his latest book, The State of the Black Church, and his new somewhat controversial billion-dollar partnership aimed at uplifting underserved communities. It's the start of the 9 a.m. Sunday service at the Potter's House. And while the praise team has the church rocking, Bishop T.D. Jakes is backstage preparing to speak to his global audience. I often wonder with the men of the cloth, whether it's like, you know, Sunday football, you're getting ready to hit oh, that gridiron. Yeah, you know, yeah. The adrenaline starts pumping. Yeah, your adrenaline is yeah. pumping. And, and you have to be able to be here you have to be multidimensional. Let's do it. When all hell has broken loose in your life, that's when we find out, are you a man? T.D. Jakes is internationally known and respected as a preacher, and now he has an additional calling, a mission to serve as a disruptor. Thomas Dexter Jakes was born in West Virginia, the youngest of Ernest and Odith Jakes' three children. I was raised on government cheese and eating mayonnaise sandwiches, but I didn't stay there. His father was an entrepreneur who started a successful janitorial company that pulled his family out of poverty. He gave Jakes his business acumen. His eloquence was imparted by his school teacher mother. Faith in tragedy would frame who he would become. At age 11, Jakes' father became sick. It was a long goodbye. The elder Jakes died when his son was 16. That drove me closer to God. A dying father teaches his son to value life because you cannot take it for granted. He became a pastor in 1976, a televangelist in 1993, and in 1996 he founded the Potter's House, the now 30,000-member megachurch in Dallas. Today his sermons are translated into 90 languages, reaching more than 70 million people in 132 countries each week. T.D. Jakes is arguably the most influential religious leader in the United States. The 66-year-old has written a number of New York Times bestsellers, including this year's Disruptive Thinking. In it, he writes, this book is about those of us who are willing to change our lives rather than live in the regrets of what if. His character far outweighs his charisma. Against all of Jamal Bryant is also a pastor of a megachurch, the New Birth Cathedral near Atlanta. He has been the standard bearer of what it means to do unconventional thinking. He, he made it rain! But it is some of Jake's, some say old-fashioned thinking, that has at times brought controversies, including the Sunday we visited. I know this is gonna get me on TikTok for sure, but here I go. 
If another woman tells me how to be a father, I will open my mouth and flat out scream. I, you can no more tell me how to be a father than I can tell you how to birth a baby. The bishop says he understands criticism comes with the job, and he says that's not his worry. What I am worried about is, Lord, help me to be a good steward of the opportunities that you have given me and that I gave back to the people that have been so good to me, our community. And I, I almost can't talk about that. I owe it to give something back. This is your he wants to change the conventional wisdom of how many see a church leader. He is also the CEO of the T.D. Jakes Group, a conglomerate comprised of the nonprofit T.D. Jakes Ministries and the T.D. Jakes Foundation. There are also his for-profit entities. T.D. Jakes Enterprises publishes his books and produces his film and television projects. It currently has deals with multiple Hollywood studios. Bishop Jakes has found that balancing act of doing business without reducing himself to being a prosperity preacher. My mother brought all kinds of property in West Virginia. All I'm really doing is what my parents did in front of me. The most lucrative part of his portfolio is T.D. Jake's real estate ventures. In April, they announced a 10-year, $1 billion partnership with Wells Fargo to build multi-income housing communities. Their first project is the building of a housing development on 94 acres located at the former home of Fort McPherson in Atlanta. Stats suggest that when all poor people live with all poor people, upward mobility becomes impossible. Mixed income houses show the best results. I want to keep building something. But the deal has faced some backlash because of the bank's well-known poor record with communities of color and other well-documented unethical business practices. Department of Justice. In 2012, the U.S. Department of Justice settled a lawsuit with Wells Fargo based on government allegations that the bank discriminated against qualified African-American and Hispanic borrowers. And in December, Wells Fargo agreed to pay a $3 billion fine after admitting to opening various accounts in their customers' names without their permission. What do you tell people why you partnered with them? They partnered with me. <laughs> we had committed to Atlanta before the Wells Fargo deal. In May, Wells Fargo CEO Charles Scharf addressed the controversy. We have a long way to go to be able to reach communities of color. I believe in redemption. If you will hand me a brick that will help me build a house for someone, I will take it from any hand. Mm. My responsibility begins once you hand me the brick. Being an entrepreneur and a preacher, do you see the duality there as part of just an overall ministry? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I think it's still ministry. That's a great, great question. It's odd that you would say that. I actually do think that that has a ministry component. We also spoke about the state of the black church. We have a very practical savior. The people are hungry. He said, take this lunch and feed them. That brings a practicality to the gospel. And without it, I think our words get hollow if we talk about a sandwich, but we never serve one. Even with all that he's built, it's his family he's most proud of. Jake's and his wife of 41 years, Sarita, have five children and eight grandchildren. Give me a sense of how your offspring uh, I knew that would bring a smile. It got you. me right away. <laughs> it got me. That's not fair. You hit me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Give not me fair. a sense of how you see your legacy in them. There's a reason I breathe. I'm going to stop there. I, can't, I can see it. I can't do that. They're the reason I, I breathe, I, I fight. Not so much to leave something to them. I fight to leave something in them. I want to leave some stones behind me, not just sermons, but tangible evidence that it is possible for a mayonnaise eating, <laughs> sugar sandwich eating boy growing up in the hills of West Virginia to do what my mama told me to do. She said, boy, Leave your mark on the world and let the world know 
you were here. Coming up next, one of the hottest artists in the world, Kahindi Wiley, sits down with Michelle Miller to share his vision of black art and the secret to his success. When America in Black continues in a moment. Welcome back to America in Black. I'm Michelle Miller, co-host of CBS Saturday Morning. Kahinde Wiley is one of the most in-demand artists in the world, best known for his distinctive presidential portrait of Barack Obama. Wiley's work draws large and diverse crowds to top-end museums and art galleries, where black artists have historically been shut out. I recently caught up with Wiley, who is not only elevating the representation of black people in art, but actively supporting the next generation of artists. It's one of the biggest nights of the year in the New York City art scene, a packed house for the opening of Kahinde Wiley's new exhibition, Havana. In recent years, Wiley has become one of the highest profile artists, black or otherwise, in the world with his paintings sought by high-profile collectors, including Jay-Z and Alicia Keys. Wiley's popularity has soared since the unveiling of his iconic presidential portrait of Barack Obama. But his success has not come from painting the powerful or famous, but rather by elevating the image of everyday black people. The common person knows your work now. When you go to a Kanye Wiley exhibition, people recognize who is in the room and they recognize it looks like them. Wow. And these are all Cubans. They are. These are the same people that I met in the streets of Havana, in the poses of classical painting sometimes and in the poses of theatrical performance. Few would have predicted success in the rarefied art world for Wiley he grew up in South Central Los Angeles, raised by a single mother. Money back then was tight, but Wiley's mother made sure Kehinde saw the world beyond his roots. My mom, who didn't have much, she had six kids and single parent, found a program that sent me to Russia at the age of 12. And from that very moment on, the world seemed possible. It seemed within arm's reach. It was while viewing art at home and abroad that Wiley realized people who looked like him were missing from the walls of the museums he visited. I remember seeing Gainsborough portraits of lords and ladies of leisure. It's these amazing powdered wigs and uh, pearls and lapdogs and feeling a sense of alienation, but also feeling a sense of how in the world did they make these gorgeous paintings? Wiley went to school to study how to paint classical portraits, but it wasn't until an art residency in Harlem that he began to reimagine the depiction of black people in art. He was someone who was seeing deeply, but understanding the implications of representation, even as a young artist. Thelma Golden is the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Golden had just joined the museum when Wiley began his residency and witnessed his breakthrough as an artist. One day he picked up a flyer and on the flyer was a mugshot with an image of a young African-American man. And in that moment, Kehinde found his practice, in some ways his purpose, in thinking about the implications of portraiture, the way in which we are seen, and the ways in which that often is not how we see ourselves. I just literally would go into the streets and I would stop people and I would say, would you uh, come and, and sit for me as, for a portrait? Wiley's portraits of Harlem residents set amidst classical backgrounds, elevated his everyday subjects to something akin to majestic royalty. His new series of portraits created a sensation. Celebrities like Michael Jackson and LL Cool J were soon commissioning his paintings. The idea that we can bring this many people together for hip hop and for art at the same time is awesome. Then came a request from the most famous of them all, one that would secure Wiley a place in history. It was a breakthrough in presidential portraiture. Nothing like it is seen if you go to the Smithsonian and look at the Presidential Hall of Paintings. 
It was an incredibly risky uh, decision for a head of state to choose a painting like that for his legacy, but I think that's in keeping with the man himself. February 12, 2018, the unveiling of the official presidential portrait. He's on stage, and then the call is for me to come up. Mr. Kennedy White. And I froze as I felt my voice shaking. Uh, it was incredibly emotional. I remember walking back to my seat and hearing Michelle Obama saying, you forgot something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. And of course I run back to stage. Talk about uh, uh, not recognizing the real source of the light. My mother, Freddie Mae Wiley, can you please stand? There is nothing I can say. This is really where it all starts. And um, we didn't have much, but she found a way to get paint and just the ability to, 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 oh, shut up and breathe. <laughs> the ability to, to, to be able to picture something bigger than that piece of South Central LA that we were living in. You saw it, you did it, thank you. But it was a reunion with his long lost father in Nigeria that helped plant the seeds for the next chapter of Wiley's journey. Wiley has set up a residency program in Dakar, Senegal, and will open a second location next year in Nigeria, where artists can come and train. My values are that when you have something, you share it so that you can shed light on others and that, that, that by being around other strong people and strong experiences, we're all enriched. I think many of those values I recognize when I go to places like Africa. It was in Africa during the 2020 pandemic that Wiley created some of his most powerful and political work, inspired by the death of George Floyd. The resulting paintings and sculptures showcased in an archaeology of silence are currently on view at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. The work forces audiences to confront the violence against black men and women around the world. And I wanted to create a monument to the silence and the sadness, to be honest with you. There's something to be said about work that is jovial and uplifting and hopeful and resilient, but there's a reason why we have monuments. What I hit upon was something that was missing from the visual language of, of art, and that has to do with mourning of black bodies in public space. And when you look at the career in total, what you understand is an artist who's leaving a profound mark on our culture. He's open museums to new audiences. And let's remember, he's continuing to work. He's continuing to innovate. He's continuing to think deeply about what art is and what it can be. I think my job as an artist is to constantly evolve. At my best, I see myself as a type of chimera, a shapeshifter, someone who goes out into the world and sees as much as the world changes, so should I. Coming up next, MTV's Doma T. Pongo explores the undeniable power of Afrobeats. When America in Black continues in a moment. Welcome back to America in Black. I'm MTV correspondent Doma T. Pongo. With rhythmic sounds and roots in Africa, Afrobeats music is exploding in popularity. And its biggest stars are topping charts, selling out arenas, winning Grammys, and shaking up the music industry. Tonight, a look at the origins and impact of the music genre that is resonating with millions across the diaspora. African Rhythms Rock Miami at Afro Nation's first U.S. festival in May. as 50,000 fans vibe to Afrobeat's top artists. Burna Boy, Wizkid, Uncle Waffles, CK, and Fireboy DML. We need more of this, you know, 
festivals that celebrate African music, African artists. Afrobeats may be the fastest growing genre of music in the world today. With African artists topping charts, selling out arenas, winning Grammys, and beckoning millions to discover more about this genre. What is Afrobeats? It's modern African music being made in this era that's influenced by many different sounds. Def Jam CEO Tunji Balagoon has been championing Afrobeats artists throughout his entire career. How did you know that this is going to be a global, massive phenomenon? Number one, the music's really, really good. <laughs> Fireboy DML single, Peru, featuring Ed Sheeran, spent 15 weeks on the Billboard charts. The Nigerian artist was the BET Awards' first ever Afrobeats performer in 2022. BET, they call me Fireboy DML. Thank you for having me tonight. In my music, you can tell I make pop. I make R&B, I make soul. Those are my early influences, you know. Music is freedom. You can just do whatever you like. While modern day Afrobeats is continuing to evolve, the genre has distinct roots in Africa. This blend can be traced back to the 1970s. Nigerian musician Fela Kuti blended West African music with funk and jazz creating protest anthems that made him a legend in world music. For me, I swear, as long as Africa they suffer, Africa they hungry, Africa no unite, no freedom, no justice. Yes, the fella era, the high life era, was Afrobeat, uh, singular, not plural. What was that sound? What was happening in that era? I mean, that sound, I think, is a mix of a lot of different local styles and local instruments and traditional songs that were kind of updated. Regional styles like Amapiano, High Life, Juju, and Fuji forged together with influences of soul, hip hop, R&B, and dance hall. So it's really kind of like a catch-all term for a lot of different sounds and genres and that live within it. Many of the artists are being categorized under that, but they make different styles of music. I don't wanna let you go. As it developed in Ghana, Nigeria, and the UK, this fusion became known as Afrobeats. I would hear Afrobeats records, and they were being celebrated and danced to like they were already hits. You know, the, the UK was ahead of the curve, again, because the diaspora <laughs> is so heavy in the UK. Journalist Yvier Ani calls this transnational phenomenon cross-cultural communication. This modern, popular African music is an intra-communal conversation between black people. It's almost an indescribable feeling because music is the easiest medium to communicate culturally. It's the easiest way to get people to pay attention to other parts of culture, whether it's fashion, food, history. Since Afrobeats began peaking on mainstream charts in the mid-2000s, there have been a number of breakthrough moments leading to crossover success. Some of your favorite hits over the last decade may have been Afrobeats, including 2004, Two Baba's African Queen. In 2011, Kanye West signed DeBange to his label. And later, around 2015, Drake hopped on WizKid's Ojo Legba remix. In 2019, Beyonce released The Gift album in collaboration with Disney's The Lion King. And everyone took notice in 2022 when Burna Boy headlined Madison Square Garden, becoming the first Nigerian and first Afrobeats artist to sell out the world's most famous arena. The music industry is taking notice of the sounds from Africa. BET, thank you so much. For the BET paved the way by honoring Afrobeats artists. Now, the American Music Awards have added a favorite Afrobeats artist category. Billboard added an Afrobeats chart. And in 2024, the Grammys are introducing the best African music performance category. For rising African artists like Adekunle Gold, the appeal of the music is undeniable. Why do you think African music is resonating this way across the globe right now? It's beautiful. Like, there's no vibe like our vibe. 
The Lagos native known for hits like Party No Day Stop and High featuring DeVito is part of the rising class of artists redefining Afrobeats. I don't jump on trends, but I take tempos of trends. So even if I like a particular sound, a vibe that's going on, I always find a way to bring it to me. This infectious energy is finding ways to connect people. Do you think that this interest across the globe in African music will affect the African diaspora to reconnect with the continent in any real way? Afrobeats is making people go in to do their DNAs, bro. <laughs> That's huge. You don't even understand half of what they're saying, but you, you just know if it feels like, yeah, home. I know people who never really understood Yoruba, who learned Yoruba language just because of me or Ashake. It's stuff like that that just makes you feel like, yeah, music is really a universal language. I think that people are learning out loud. That's what Afrobeats probably sounds like to people trying to connect to their African roots or connect to a culture that was stripped from them. Even to different generations of African immigrants trying to connect to their own history. Beyond languages and borders, the rise of Afrobeats has shown just how powerful music can be. One of the reasons why people love Afrobeats so much is because the music is so full of life and so uh, overwhelmingly positive and feel good. It's very livable heartful music. Oh, Coming up next, Roy Wood Jr. drops the mic on black music when America in Black continues in a moment. Hey, I'm Roy Wood Jr. The BET Awards just wrapped up recently, which is a wonderful celebration of black music and culture. The show has always been a nod to the past while looking at the future stars of black music. Speaking of the future stars, a younger artist, she has a hit song called Area Code. Callie shocked everybody when she said she hadn't heard the hit song by Ludacris of the same name. 504-972-713. You know how black people get when somebody ain't heard a song we love. How you ain't heard no ludicrous? Man, you, you young people don't know nothing about the classics. Look, did we learn our parents' music? Yes, we did. But let's also be real about something. Most of us were in a hostage situation when we got to learn the black classics. You were stuck in a car on a long road trip, your mama was doing housework with the soul music cranked to the max, or you were at a cookout or a get-together where you couldn't control the aux cord. Hell, it was the 70s and the 80s. There was no aux cord back then. <laughs> Kids today are not in the same hostage music situation that we were in. We had a Walkman. And all we had was the same five or six CDs you could afford. Once you got bored with those songs, yeah, I'm gonna listen to my mama play some Barry White and Dion Warwick. But if you had a pair of earbuds and a phone that could hold every song you love by every artist you've ever loved, we would have never ran out of options and we may not have known about Barry White our dang selves. We wouldn't have been held hostage in the car by our parents' music selections. And in fairness to Kelly, Area Codes by Ludacris ain't exactly the type of song your parents should be playing while fixing Sunday dinner. <laughs> Which is why I love what I've been seeing this year from black concerts. If you've been paying attention on social media, droves of black people are traveling coast to coast all over the globe to see wonderful black music. They're going to see Beyonce in Europe. They're going to see Usher in Vegas, Janet coast to coast, and everybody else was down in New Orleans for Essence Fest. But they aren't just traveling alone. A lot of these people today, they're taking their kids. And not only is this a testament to how good black music is, but isn't it just cool to just see black people having this kind of disposable income? When the last time you heard a black person say, hey, you know I'm going to Hungary to see Beyonce tomorrow. I catch y'all on Tuesday. <laughs> the best images coming from these concerts are the images of black families going to some of these events, mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, sometimes three generations deep to enjoy live black music. This is the best possible form of exposing your kids to the classics and learning about the music we love growing up. Now, there's a lot of live music out there to choose from this summer. Um, but if I could recommend one artist, I would say take your kids to go see Janet Jackson. The opening act, Ludacris. 
I got pros. I got pros in different area codes. I'm in New York at the Puerto Rican Day Parade. In that night, I'm in New Orleans drinking hand grenades. Outnumbered by the dozens at the Jazz Fest. And Mardi Gras, all the women trying to show me they chest. Hey. I'm in Jamaica spending massive bucks. While the ladies are begging me to mosh it tough. I had...